Now, this man here, Richard Turner, he does things that nobody else in the world can do with cars. Nobody. I don't care if you go to China or France or Germany. He does things that nobody else can do. He does them beautifully. But as I say, that's very rare. Very rare to have experts like that. Всем привет, дорогие друзья! Мы снова на канале About Magic. И сегодня у нас в гостях выдающийся человек, мировая звезда карточной магии, впервые в России, мистер Ричард Тернер. Привет, Russian magicians! Привет, привет! So, Richard, I will ask you a couple questions. Uh, do you remember how you got interested in card tricks and how old you were? I started working with cards when I was seven. We were a very poor family. We had four games, Monopoly, chess, checkers, and a deck of cards. And I was the oldest, and I didn't like to lose. So I started figuring out ways to where I would manipulate the cards so I always won when I'd play cards with my sisters. And what caught my interest in manipulating cards were old TV westerns like mm -hmm. Maverick, Gunsmoke, uh, Big Valley, Bonanza, all of those TV shows, there would be gambler come into town and like Maverick, he'd be such a cool gambler. I thought, I want to be a cool gambler and make sure that when I play cards, I always won. So that's what first got my interest with cards and I started practicing with them. Uh, who is your idol in the world of card magic? Who influenced you and why? My idol in card magic was Di Vernon. I, had the pre I met him in 1975. I'll give you a quick story. I found out I was working on a TV show with a guy named Bob Yerkes, Y-E-R-K-E-S, mm -hmm. learning, teaching people how to swing on the trapeze, how to tightrope, how to uh, uh, take high falls stunt work. And we would train celebrities. And a guy named J.C. Wagner said, Di Vernon would like to meet you. I just turned 21. And so I was old enough to go into the Magic Castle. I found out the night before I had to have a suit to get into the Magic Castle. A suit and a tie, you know, a dress. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a suit and a tie. I thought, oh my gosh, where am I going to get a suit and tie? So I went to the shopping center and I went into a men's store. I put my, coat, my cards on this coat rack and I'm looking at coats and looking for the cheapest one. And the salesman comes up and says, I'll cut you high card for that coat. <laughs> and I thought, this is my lucky day. Yes. I thought, okay. And he goes, no, no, I'm just kidding. Making a joke. I said, tell you what. I said, come over here. And we went to his desk where they have the cash register. I took out two twos and a queen. I said, watch. Two twos and a queen. I said, if you find the queen, I'll pay twice as much for the coat. If you get it raw, if you don't get it, you give me the coat for re. He said, really? I said, really? Well, I threw the cards. He missed. So I got a coat for free. I said, tell you what, I'll bet the coat against a pair of pants. So I did it again. He lost the pants. I said, tell you what, coat, pants for a tie and a shirt. I walked out of, walked out of there with a brand new suit and I didn't pay a dime. And that day, I, the next day I went to the Magic Castle and waiting for me was Di Vernon. And with Di Vernon was a famous actor named Tony Giorgio, G-I-O-R-G-I-O. -I -O. In the movie Godfather, mm -hmm. there's a scene where a guy takes a knife and stabs it in his hand. And he pins the guy's hand to the bar. And they go, ah! And then they took a piano wire and they grotted him to death in the movie. The actor that stabbed it was he played Bruna Tataglia in the movie. That was Tony Giorgio. And I'm with Di Vernon here, and Giorgio's sitting over here at the castle, just, just the four of us. Jo Vernon, Giorgio over there, and my friend that brought me. And I'm showing stuff to Vernon, and Giorgio would yell, won't get the money, won't get the money. That means it's not good, not good. Won't, won't get the money means it's not good enough to win at, at, at a poker table. And I'd show something else, and he'd yell again, over, way over there, not even in part of our group. Won't get the money. And then, then I showed Vernon one of the things 
um, well, for one of the things I was doing, the way I was doing my handling, Diverner said was very unnatural. He said, that's too suspicious. He says, I don't care how fine the brief is, when you deal like this, I know you're up to something crooked. So it's not natural. And then I showed him my, my casual second deal, this one here, and he goes, now that one I like because it was more naturally done. It wasn't as suspicious looking. So that's when I first met Di Vernon, and he took a liking to me. He, for some reason, he liked this crazy kid. And so uh, I had the privilege of working with him for 17 years. And because I was crazy in my practice time, um, I would practice like 10, 12, 14, 16, 20 hours every day. Average was 14 hours every day practicing with the cards, seven days a week. And he would see crazy me like he was crazy. So then he started teaching me things. And then he started teaching me things that he didn't teach anybody else. And then, uh, then he started tricking me. Uh, I'll explain. Uh, because I couldn't see exactly what he was showing me, he would say, Richard, this is how it's done. He said, you, your hands need to be very relaxed, very naturally held. And then when you go to take the card, all your fingers should be on this side. Because when you hold the deck like this, it's suspicious to people. They know you're going to do something crooked, dirty. They're, you're going to cheat. So if you act like there's no tension, no effort, because he said a four-year-old can deal a card off the top. So when you deal a second card, it has to be just as easy as if you're dealing off the top. And uh, so he tricked me. He didn't describe the, word, the moves to me in the way that he could do them or the way that anybody else could do them. He described them to me in the way he wished he could do them and he wished they could be done. And because I believed that, they, that he could do them, I thought, if he can do them, I can do them. So I practiced, 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 1,000 hours, 2,000 hours, 4,000. Then I come back and show him, and he goes, Richard, that's it. That's perfect. And so he, um, because I was so, I practiced so hard, he kept giving me more and more challenges. And he would trick me, like I said, making me think that he could do it but he could not do it. Mm -hmm. So Di Vernon is my, my mentor with cards. Uh, so how did you learn magic without seeing what your colleagues were doing and without watching tutorials? Very good question. I've never read a book. I've, I've actually only read two books in my life on magic. One, I listened to Erdnays, mm -hmm. Expert at the Card Table by S.W. Erdnays. But it was read by this old lady. And it sounded like, then you take the cards and you push over a card. And you, you know, that's what she sounded like. Like she was getting ready to fall over dead. <laughs> <laughs> and so that I listened to that and trying to figure out the moves from this old lady reading the book. And the only other one I read was Seconds, Centers, and Bottoms by Ed Marlowe. And it was read to me by my first wife. And because she didn't understand it, she read each move only one time. And you can't get understand it only read it, hearing it one time. So that's the only two books. But where I was very fortunate is that I got to know Ed Marlowe personally. I got to learn from Ed Marlowe. I got to learn from Charlie Miller. I got to learn from Larry Jennings. I got to learn from Tony Giorgio. And the most was uh, Di Vernon. Um, and so, um, and like I said, Vernon would describe to me how the best way to do a move was. And Di Vernon took Erdnays from the 19th century, 1902. He took those ways of doing things to the 20th century. He improved on them. And then Di Vernon said, I took what he did and took it to the 21st century to a whole new level. So um, that's how is by personal one-on-one -on -one interaction with some of the best card men. And then what I would do is I would, they would tell me an idea. Mm -hmm. And then I would analyze that idea and figure out how to do it in a, in a, even, even a better way. Uh, how's your training going on? Like, do you work uh, on one move constantly or you're working on lots of moves in one training session? Another good question. Uh, I do both, 
But first, I have the one move that is my primary objective, the one that I want to get down. That's the one I'm focused on at, 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 at any given point. Like I'll give an example with my push off second. I would analyze the move, okay? I think about how is it, how can I do this to make it really smooth where it doesn't, where it doesn't have the normal tip offs that other second deals have. Like some people would do this, strike second. You can see it come out or they, and they would do this. We call it necktie dealing. That's suspicious. Mm -hmm. Crossing the thumbs to take the card, going across like this, that's not natural. When you push over a card, you're pushing it over to take it. And if you cross your thumbs to take it, that's not natural. So I would analyze, how can I do this without crossing the thumbs, without the second card coming across the top? So I would break the move down into its most uh, smallest pieces. And then I would, I would analyze it, and I'd do it slow motion, super slow motion, until every exacting part of that move is in my brain, in, in my muscle memory. And I would sit there and practice it over and over till I, and then when I start getting, I would turn it into a subconscious habit. In other words, while we're gonna be sitting here interviewing, I'm gonna be doing moves over and over and over and not even know I'm doing it. I turn the move into a habit. That's why I was able to practice 10, 12, 15 hours at a time on one move. So then to the, a second part of your question is, do you do multiple moves? Then when I would take a break, mm -hmm. when I would take, uh, I did this one like uh, four hours straight, then I, would, I might stop and, uh, and, and just uh, and do, uh, do another variation as a, to break it up and, and, then, um, and then, then I would get back to the, the first move that, that, I was, that I was working on. So, but the, uh, I believe that you should take and master one move completely before moving on to, an, to another move. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, the next question is really similar. Uh, how do you stay in shape, meaning card tricks, and how do you follow what your colleagues are doing, like new moves coming? Uh, uh, can you make these all face down? Yep. Um, Done. Thank you. Спасибо. Пожалуйста. Well, everything in my show, every technique and method are my own. I don't do anybody else's moves mm -hmm. or techniques. So you saw my show, yeah. and you watched how I dealt from the bottom. You saw how I dealt from the middle. You saw how I stacked the cards, how I false shuffled. All of those are my own methods and creations. So like I said, I have an objective. How can I, how can I shuffle the cards, uh, say feral shuffle, and then and, and, and strip them out? You know, so I think of my objective, and then I will um, uh, practice it. So, so all the, like I said, all the moves in my show are different than the way you've seen your classic magician do them. Because they all started with a book, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And in that book, they like Erdnays like this, hold the cards, mechanics grip. So everybody holds it like this. And that now is suspicious. And, uh, uh, and because I did not have the book to have a picture the way they did, that's why all my moves uh, look different. And um, Di Vernon said, and Charlie Miller, if you know who he was, uh, yep. and Tony George, all of them said they are, they've been greatly improved much, much more natural and much more deceptive. Mm -hmm. And how are you practicing your tricks on spectators since you don't know what and where they're looking at? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tricky question. Yeah. I can feel people's looking. Uh -huh. I can feel when people are looking at me. And here's the thing. You, if you, you want to get a move down, where it, you could do it in slow motion and they still can't see it. If you could do it right under their nose in slow motion, because your technique is very, very clean, then it doesn't matter where they're looking. Mm -hmm. When I do my show, I'll tell them they can watch from anywhere they want. They can watch as close as they want. True. You remember when I was on Penn and Teller? Teller was like this. Yes. And then 
afterwards, when I went and I performed live with them a year later, um, Penn would tell, tell the story that Teller was two inches, two inches from my hands like this, watching. And he says, Teller says, well, Penn says, Richard, you're not helping me at, helping at all. And Teller says, all you're doing is hurting my brain. <laughs> and and Penn, would say, would, Penn would say, Teller was only two inches away. And Richard's explaining exactly what he's doing. And Teller still could not see it or understand it. And it said it just hurt his brain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so that's the kind of the answer is make your technique so smooth that when you do it normal speed, they're not going to catch it. If you can do it, like I said, this is a simple example. Yep. If you can do it super slow and it's still deceptive, you know, then when you do it at no normal speed, you know, then, it, it, then it's even uh, more deceptive. And uh, magicians have this habit of covering a, a, a big action, a small action with a bigger action. Yes. And that, with gambling, will get you shocked. Yes. In magic, it's okay. But at poker table, that becomes suspicious. Mm -hmm. And where I'm from in Texas, lots of cowboys, lots of gamblers, lots of people bang, bang, dead for trying to do that at the card table. Yeah. <laughs> okay? So, and I say that Sometimes the bigger action, instead of trying to, uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell another story. Tony Slidini. Have you heard of Tony Slidini? Of course. He, me, Di Vernon, Slidini, we traveled together. Okay, Las Vegas, New York, a lot of places. Slidini was like our tag along, if you know what I mean. He would, it would be me and Vernon, and Slidini would say, can I go too? Mm -hmm. So he was always with us. And one day we were at the, uh, we were at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas. And Slidini says, Richard, when you do your second, go like this. Go like this. It'll make it even harder for people to see. Mm -hmm. And Di Vernon says, don't do it like that. That is suspicious. Tony does not understand the way of the gambler. Don't listen to Tony Slidini. <laughs> and, uh, and so to get back to the point, you're trying to cover th this the action of taking the second card by, by this big action here, when if you do it with a little action, in other words, no action, the, see, I have no action. I let my hand, I rest my hand on the table, so there's no movement, but yet it can be more deceptive because now the normal action of taking the card, this becomes the big action mm -hmm. that hides the, the, dis, the, the dishonest part of it because all the tension is over here on the, on, the, on the hand taking the card. Does that make sense? Yes. So instead of trying to hide it, let the, 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 all the attention is going to be on this instead of going like this and, and drawing their suspicion on you. For me, you're dealing first. All I can tell. They're all second. Yes. No, never a first. I, I, nev I, can, I cannot see that. Just, I cannot see it. Are you face down? Yeah, all face down. Thank you. Поместите карты в колоду, я отвернусь и не буду подсматривать. Даже глаза закрою. Так, перетасуйте карты. Смешайте их. Когда закончите, положите вот сюда. Спасибо. Смотрим. В этот раз я буду доставать по одной карте снизу, снизу колоды. Это какая карта? Как это? А ведь карты тасовали вы. Какая это карта? Дама. Смотрим, смотрим. Это делал не кто-то, это Ольга делала. Потасуем, потасуем, потасуем. Еще разок, и еще раз. Смотрим. Она? Еще раз. И еще раз. Еще раз. Положите их обратно в колоду. Рубашкой вверх. 
только спрячьте получше и перетасуйте. Можете даже дать зрителям перетасовать, если хотите. Или жюри. Так, хорошо. Готовы? Мои пальцы как бы видят карты. Я разделяю колоду посередине. Из центра колоды. Из самого центра. Это какая карта? А это? Смотрим еще раз в замедленном действии. Да ну нет! Да ну как? Вообще, это что такое? Ну это нереально, ну... Итак, надеюсь, вам понравилось. Спасибо. Спасибо. Okay, so we got to the next question. Uh, what is the most important trick in your life? Maybe the one you were working for a, quite a long time. The one where I let you shuffle, I let you tell me how many players for poker, and I let you tell me which player you want me to have the winning position, where you want the winning position. When I first came up with that combination of ideas, of combining this technique with this and this, I was at the Magic Castle with Professor Vernon. We're standing at the bar, he's sitting, I'm standing. I said, Professor, what do you think about combining this and this and this? And Professor Vernon says, you want me to do it in my Vernon voice? Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, well, well, uh, Professor Vernon says, it can't be done, Professor, you can't do it. Your hands can't move that fast, your hand, you, 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 you break rhythm, your hands can't be that sensitive. It's not, it's not possible to do. And I thought, oh, and I was depressed for about 10 minutes. I stood there going, oh, he says it can't be done. And I thought, And so I thought, I, 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 for 10 minutes, I was sad. And then all of a sudden I went, hold it, but I can do it. And I said, Professor, come watch my show. So he comes into my show at the Magic Castle. After the show, he goes, Richard, what the hell were you doing in there? What the hell were you doing? I don't understand what the hell you were doing. I said, remember when you said you can't combine this technique and this technique? That's what I'm doing. I don't, know how, I don't understand how the hell you can do that. How are you going to give them always the good cards? So that, that is my favorite thing to do. And if you want, I will do that for you right now as one of the things if, uh, if you want to see. Yeah, let's see it, of okay. course. Okay, uh, shuffle them up. Done. Okay. We have a, we have a kind of, a, let's, we'll use more some of this other area. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. We, we'll, okay, we'll give the deck a cut and How many players? Four, for, so it was small, four yeah. or five? Let's say four. Where do you want to sit? One, two, three, four. Which one is you? I'll be number two. Number two. One, this one's you right here. Yeah. Number two, number three, number four. Number one, this one's you right here. Number yes. two, number three, number four. And now we have the face up cards. One, this one's you right here. Number two. Now watch this. Mix them up some more. And you can even keep high cards. You can even take cards out of the deck and give me back whatever you want. Here you go. So we have number three and number four. Yes. Number one. And you chose number two. Do you have cards in your hand? Yes, I have. Switch with me. Shuffle them and switch with me. Okay. Did you, did you shuffle them? Yes? Yes. So you just shuffle these, right? Yes. And you just hand them to me. What's this first card? What's that? Uh, Ace of Diamonds. What's this one? Jack of Hearts. Player two, player three, player four. Player one, this one's you right here, number yes. two. What's that? King of Hearts. King. Switch with me. Did you shuffle those? Switch. Uh, let me, sw uh, let me shuffle. shuffle a little bit. Yeah. Anything you want. Done. Okay. Switch. Okay. Jesus. Okay. And here's player three. Yes. And here's player four. And so far we have three face up, yes? Yes. Three one. face up. This is the last face up one. What's this one? It's the ten of diamonds. Take them back, mix them up some more. Okay. I will add them to the full deck. You're, you're the boss. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. And we have, we have player three. We have player four. Now we have what's called down and dirty. One. You chose two. Three. Four. So 
You shuffled yes. many times. You chose four players. You chose this one to win. And in poker, in seven card stud, they have what's called high spade wins half the money. Mm -hmm. Make sure I get all the cards yes, here. Yes, all the cards okay. here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So whoever has the high spade as their face down card wins half the money. So let's see what this hand has. What's this one? Ten of diamonds. Ten. It's a king of hearts. King. Jack of hearts. Jack. Ace of diamonds. Ace. So you, you're sitting on a belly buster. What's this? It's the queen of spades. Ten, jack, queen, king, ace. And we're playing high spade in the hole. What's this? And that's an ace of spades. There's the high spade in the hole. That's a queen of hearts. But you shuffled. Yes. You chose four players. You chose number two to win. You shuffled each time. And this was an example of when I was saying, if you do the move even in slow motion, um, it makes it more deceptive. Did you see how many times I dealt from other no, places? No, no. None, none of those cards came off the top. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Well, a lot of them, some did, but most of, most of them did not come off the top. Yeah. More came off other, than, other places than the top. Jesus. But it's because, I, like I said, you, do, you act like you're doing nothing. Yes. You, if you look like you're doing something suspicious, it draws attention. And so I did it very slow as I dealt more for the magicians to understand what I'm explaining. And you watched it, you saw it all come happen, so I'm not just telling you what I can do or how to do it, you actually watched it happen, and then they'll play that tape over and over and over, yes. going where, 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 when, when, when. <laughs> when it's natural, it's not suspicious, so I'm not even looking for something suspicious, yeah, right? Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah, and the it. thing is, and, I'm, and the thing is, when you get the technique down, to where you can even draw attention. I was drawing your attention. I was saying, watch, yes. slow motion. In the, like I said, it looks like they came from the top, but if they came from the top, this person would not have won. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, so and that was the one that Di Vernon said was, uh, not, you could not do, and it's one of my favorite things, but not just seven stud, all poker games. Mm -hmm. Blackjack or anything, I do the same thing. So the next question is, how do you prepare your hands before any performance? Ah, very good. The curse of a card band is your hands getting dry. The older you get, your body dries up. And so that was what Driver would say, the curse of a card band is your hands going dry. And you don't want your hands too sweaty, like real mm -hmm. hot and drip drip, that's no good. If they're too dry, you go like this, you know, trying to get the card off. So you want a, just the right temperature. What I do is I take and I put my hands in very hot water, very hot water, and I put about five minutes, and I let them soak. And what that does is it opens up the pores, mm -hmm. you know, the sweat pores. Yeah. It opens them up, and then I take a, a lotion, a kind of lotion that has no oil in it, like a woman's face cream. A woman does not want oily face. Mm -hmm. So it's a lotion with no oil, and I put it on my hands, and I let it sit, and then I'll go like this below if I want to make it go faster, and then that closes the lotion inside the pores. The pores will close up and keep the moisture in, and then I will take a paper towel and take the rest off, and that will make my hands good for about two or three hours of performance. So that's what I do before every show. My wife calls it my ritual mm -hmm. to get your hands, because that's, this is, first, the most important thing is the hands. Second is good cards. And so first I have to have my instrument. My hands are like my violin, mm -hmm. my guitar, my piano. You must take care of your instrument. And so I lotion them at least eight or ten times every day. How about this? Queen, yes. Ben, yes. Queen. Uh, queen. Yeah. And Ben, yes. This is so if you go to New York. 
they play this on the street. I won't move until you say go. Say go. 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 Where? Two. Two. Oh. So sorry. give you a souvenir. <laughs> you want a queen or two? Which one, Brad? Queen. Queen? Queen. Queen. Take it. Show everybody. What did you do? Yeah. Okay. I'm asking about queen. Yeah, so you got the wrong one. Wait, is this your queen? No, this two. That's your two. Yeah, yeah. So you missed. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you a chance to get all the money back. Okay. You, you had better luck with twos. Turn over a two and you owe no money, otherwise everybody owes me a lot of money. One, two, three. Turn one over. Turn over a two. Turn them all over. What are they? Turn them all over. Ten. All ten? Yeah. Look under here. 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 Oh yeah. See when the money gets big, I trick you. question is what is your attitude about using gimmicks in card magic do you prefer like clean sleight of hand instead of using gimmicks yes I'm not a fan of gimmicks mm -hmm. I call it you know a, a nickel and dime magic but there are people that they don't have the time they don't have the time or the years or they can't afford to do the manipulation or the more difficult stuff and that that's fine if they're but if they're doing it professionally they should do their own stuff they should not be another version of another version of another version of the same person. Um, I think that uh, people should use, if they want to be professional, they have to stand out. And you don't stand out if you're another copy of somebody else, mm -hmm. if you're just an imitation of somebody else. I had this one guy, his name was Joe. I'll just call him Joe. And he would see something, and he would steal the idea, and the next day he would try to do it in his show. And sometimes he didn't even practice, and it would look bad. Yes. Okay. Uh, you often work with the deck shuffled by spectators. Mm -hmm. uh, do you use stacks in your tricks at all? No. No. I, one of the things I do in the show is I show how I can stack the cards. But um, I do not use a stack deck at all. Because mm -hmm. you, you know, you, too much to memorize. Yeah. You know, the people memorize, like uh, Simon Aronson. You know, he had a stack deck routine. There's some very clever ones out there. But I've, I've never even, um, I've never done it. I've never done that. Mm -hmm. Uh, how would you classify different playing card surfaces, like soft, solid, ribbed, rough, and which surface works best for you? As you know, I, I'm the touch analyst for U.S. Playing Card Company. They're the biggest card maker. They make the best cards in the world. Bicycle is the most recognized back of cards. Mm -hmm. This is their best card. It's their B. Second is bicycle. They started making bicycle in 1880s. They started making B in... Uh, 1892, that's what the 92 stands for. Yes, is when 1892. They, 1892, that's when they started making them. And that's, that's what we call B92. And um, these were always their casino quality cards. And um, so you want a card with a good snap mm -hmm. because uh, if you don't have a good snap, it needs Viagra. <laughs> okay. And, and Viagra, it was expensive. <laughs> so you... <laughs> And so you want good snap, okay. and that, that, is, that takes a particular caliper. Caliper is the thickness of the card. Mm -hmm. These cards are like 11,000, 11 11.3 thousandths is the thickness of this card. Um, cards that are like 10 thousandths or, or 10.5 thousandths, 
they, they lose their strength too fast. They, you go like this too many times, and they just like this. Then they need Viagra. Mm -hmm. you know, they, 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 they sag. Um, so, um, uh, 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 and you want, you have to have a deck that's what's called embossed. You, you've seen the smooth decks. You can buy them from China, or, and they're what like we call glossy. And the thing about that is, when you first like, you're going to do a, a second card with it, very smooth at first. But the reason a, a deck is embossed, embossed means like take your finger and go like this, like that. You can feel the ridges. Yes. Mm -hmm. I actually counted them one time, <laughs> really? and I told the director of research and development at U.S. Playing Card Company. How many ridges? I counted 105, and he went back and they used their microscopes to go, my gosh, that guy's crazy. <laughs> and, um, but the reason why you want them embossed is because they can breathe. Mm -hmm. They can breathe. Because when you're playing with cards, your hands have next natural moisture, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, they just sweat. And so if they can't, when you get uh, moisture, fingerprints on the cards, the, the embossing, that's the card card breathe. If they're not embossed, they're the smooth ones. At first, they're smooth, they're good, but then they will start sticking together. You you you'll push over one, yep. and two will come because it's, it's like you know it, it, they they stick together. Mm -hmm. So that's why you don't want uh, a deck that's not embossed. Um, and then you also want a deck that's properly cut. I call it traditionally cut. Um, the, with a deck of cards is a sheet of paper. paper it's like, it's like, like this close-up mat, mm -hmm. this shape. It's 56 cards. Eight cards, seven rows, okay? Mm -hmm. And when they cut them, they will slice them into seven piles, seven spiles, okay? And then they're stacked on top of each other like, like this, okay? And they go through what's called a punch, like a cookie cutter. And, they, and the, the cookie cutter will go through that paper, and then the card will fall, fall. It will, it will cut it out, and it falls into a stack of 52. And when they punch them, they punch seven cards, uh, eight cards a second. So it takes seven seconds to punch one deck, mm -hmm. to make it, you know, seven, one, you know, because anyway, it takes all eight of them in one second. Now, <laughs> And, um, but you want it, the deck where the blade goes through the face of the card. And that is so important because when you cut something, like if I'm going to cut this thing with, with a knife, when you push here, this is the smooth side, right? Mm -hmm. Because the knife is pushing into it. Underneath would be the rough mm -hmm. side. Like if you saw wood on the top is smooth, underneath it's rough. Yep. So the reason why you want a deck where the blade goes through the face is almost every shuffle, you start, you shuffle like this. You start at the bottom and go up, right? Mm -hmm. So if they're, if, they're, if they're properly cut, they're rounded, the, the, you, know, you can feel. See, this is the rounded edge. This is the sharp edge. Mm -hmm. Round, so you go ahead and feel. See, that's the sharp edge, and this is the rounded edge because the blade went this way. Yeah. Okay. And, and so you want it cut where the blade goes this way because every, even this, even this, like this shuffle, you're still starting at the bottom and going up. Uh, casino shuffle like this, still at the bottom going up. Uh, a, a, a pharaoh shuffle, bottom going up. A, a one hand shuffle, um, you, they will slide into each other much easier if they're this way. If they're cut upside down, which almost all cards from China are cut upside down. It's like shuffling the deck this way. Mm -hmm. it, they, they bind up. You go to shuffle it, and they, they bind yes. up. And in fact, you could feel the difference. Shuffle face down, and then shuffle them face up. And every, anybody, when they f do it, they'll f now turn them yeah. over and shuffle them the other way. So it's face down, now it's Now turn face them up. face up, and yep. now shuffle, and you'll see it's not as easy. Yeah. That's because. That's hard. Yeah, and that's. Oops. Thank you. Yep. And so many decks now, they cut them backward where the blade goes through the back, putting the round edge on the back of the card instead of the face of the card. Mm -hmm. And that makes for a, a card that's not as, not as good. And uh, so that's another element. And then there's a moisture level. 
People didn't. Did you know there's a moisture level in this card? No. No, nobody, you don't think about that. Nobody thinks about that. So much details. Yes. The moisture level I like is 4.5% moisture level. They were doing 5.2% moisture level was average. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was the moisture level of a card. It's 5.2%. But that moisture level, they, I, get, I call it, they get cakey. If you have a deck that kind of goes like this faster than other decks, where they kind of get soggy, that's because they have a higher moisture level when they, when they made the card. So you want a moisture level of like 4.5%, but only I and a few people know that. Um, <laughs> the people that we, when we make the cards at U.S. Playing Card Company. Okay. But um, I, that's the inside details uh, stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, so you want, uh, 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 and, and the reason why you want a lower moisture level is it has a better snap, snap for a longer period of time. Yeah, got it. Got it. So much details. I didn't even think about this. Yeah. Well, that's because I've been their touch analyst for over 20, about 25 years now. Whoa. For U.S. Playing Card Company. In fact, you can, uh, the president, are you familiar with U.S. Playing Card Company? You, uh, you, I, I you, think you have bicycle cards. Yes. yes. They make them. I B, they make them. Tally Ho, they make them. Hoyle, they make them. All the big labels, all made by the same company. Mm -hmm. U.S., United States Playing Card Company. They've been making cards since 1867. Is it Cincinnati? In Cincinnati, Ohio, yeah. yes. And they, but they just, about, six, about eight years ago, they moved across the river to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So now they're in So the next question is, Hustlers and Magicians theme, uh, do they have a lot in common? No. No. That's it. <laughs> Let's go to the next question. Yeah. The, That's a the, kind of quick question. If I, I'll, I'll give you a quick reason why. Yeah, yeah, okay. Magicians can use misdirection. Yes. Like, look over here, steal something over here. Yeah. Gamblers, you cannot use misdirection. You must follow the exact procedure, the, the etiquette, the formality of the game. And if you do so anything out of, out of normal, mm -hmm. then that becomes suspicious. Yeah. And then that draws heat. And when there's money on the table and they think you're taking the money, people get upset. Mm -hmm. So magicians can use misdirection, but at the card table, you cannot use misdirection. And to deal the moves for the card table are just many, many times more difficult. Like a magician would do a double lift, right? Yep. Many, many magicians can do a double lift, but how many magicians can do a push off second deal? You know, very, very few. So the techniques are, are much more difficult. Yep, got it. Uh, you already mentioned it, but uh, can you tell us in which movies did you play? Like maybe you replaced some actor's hands. You uh, remind us of Godfather with Al Pacino, right? Uh huh. Yes, yeah, so. And uh, Marlon Brando. Godfather is Marlon Brando. Marlon Maybe. Brando. Also, you can tell yeah. about how you show tricks to Al Pacino. Oh, well, oh that's true, yeah. Uh, I perform for Al Pacino. And yeah, yeah, I entertained Al Pacino and lots of famous people like Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. I had Johnny Carson here, 
Gene Kelly, a very famous actor, dancer. Mm -hmm. Over here, Gregory Peck, another very famous actor, all at the same time. And Gene Kelly said, saying, Johnny Carson, says, Johnny, how's he doing this? You understand this stuff? And Johnny goes, I don't know, but he sure does it beautifully. And Gregory Peck says, he's my new poker partner. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, and then I've inter entertained people like uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of people that you would know. Um, uh, there was a movie called Tree of Life with Brad Pitt. And uh, they wanted a scene where Brad Pitt lost every time. Mm -hmm. And they, three people said, you have to have Richard Turner do that scene. And, um, and then uh, when they first contacted me, they said, will you shave your beard? I said, no, because it was a 1950s uh, casino, and they didn't have beards in them. They said, will you cut it real short? I said, okay, I'll do that. And then when we went on set, when we, we were going to film the thing, they said, what size do you wear? And my wife says, he wears the same size Brad Pitt wears. And they didn't even measure me. And so they got the casino, mm -hmm. it fit perfect. And I thought, how did my wife know I wore the same size as Brad Pitt? <laughs> I thought, it must be a girl thing. Yeah. And, uh, and, then, um, and then the whole time before it was my scene, I, they, they didn't know they hired somebody that couldn't see. Mm -hmm. That was never brought up. And I thought, how am I going to tell them I won't be able to find the poker table? Mm -hmm. They will have to show me, then I can do my part. And so my wife said, just tell him. And uh, so uh, Terrence Malick was the pr director, producer, and, um, and he's uh, done mer mer very famous movies. And this one I'm talking about was nominated for Best Picture, Best, di best Director, and Best Cinematography. So it was nominated for three Oscars. Um, but I, I only had, a, like I said, a small part. But when I, um, when I said to Terry Malick, I said, I can make anybody, I can make sure Brad Pitt loses every time, but you will have to show me where the table is because I can't see. And he goes, oh, no problem. And he said, in fact, I don't understand poker. Can you direct the scene for me? So I got to direct the scene. Mm -hmm. And so it was me, actor, Brad Pitt, actor, actor. And my, we're playing blackjack. And, and you know, as I'm dealing, I'm making sure Brad Pitt loses every time. Yeah. And then, um, and I told them where to put the camera. So, like, if I, like, if I'm gonna, uh, I, I hop the deck after every cut. You know, I'd hop that card. I'll, yep. I'll do it again. See, see, what, see what I'm saying? Yeah, I'd say cut the deck, and then I, I hop the deck. And I'd say to catch that, watch it from right here, so they could catch some of the cheating moves. And then, then Brad Pitt during in between scenes, Brad Pitt, would, I'd show him something. Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt would go, "Did you see that? Did you see that?" How do you do that? And Brad Pitt got more and more excited. And every year I get a note from Brad Pitt saying, tell Richard Turner, Brad Pitt says hello. But probably the most fun a celebrity that I, had to, I, I got to know and entertain was Muhammad Ali. Oh. He, he became a friend of mine and everybody knows who Muhammad Ali is. Yes. I also know his, uh, another name like Cassius Clay, I guess. Right? Yes, no, he, 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 his, when he was born, his name was Cassius yep. Clay. Then he changed in, in the 1960s, he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. And um, he, I, I, there was a, uh, a contest in Las Vegas. Siegfried and Roy, the, they had the Lion and Tiger Act in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, they hosted a get together. It was the first one, the first paid competition of all close up card men and magicians from around the world. And they said, and, and uh, so I entered it and they said, there's no way Richard Turner can win. He doesn't do any magic. His is nothing but gambling stuff. And Di Vernon says, you watch. I, he, he will be the winner. And I was the winner. But, um, uh, and Muhammad Ali was there for that. And then afterwards, Ali wanted to meet me. And so I have many stories I could tell you with Ali. Um, I'll just tell you one. Mm -hmm. they, uh, uh, we became friends. We went to shows together and did all kinds of stuff. And uh, another time, a year later, I was at a casino, and all of a sudden, four big African-American, four big black men came up to me and said, Richard Turner, you're coming with us. And I'm sitting there going, I don't think so. And two in the front, two behind, they pushed me out the back of the casino, you know, the, 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 out, the, out the yeah. back, back door of the casino, back door. pushed me in a big limousine. And then the limousine, <laughs> 
around, and they pulled it behind the back of another casino. They take two get out of the front, they pull me out, two behind me, and they go through the back door of the casino, down these halls, into a big suite, a presidential suite. And Ali comes running up, throws his arms around me in a big bear hug and goes, Richard, how you doing? It's so good to see you again. So I can say that I've been kidnapped and hugged by the three-time boxing heavyweight champion of the world. Cool. <laughs> That's a cool story. Um, uh, tell us about new feature film about you. Uh, who is the director of this film and who will play you? A lot of that stuff, <clears throat> I, I can only tell that they're going to be making a film because they have the rights to make the announcement. Mm -hmm. And I, did, I asked them um, about before I came on the show that I'm, going to be, that I'm doing here in Russia, if I can make the announcement. And they said no, because they want to have a big announcement. Got uh, it. You know, and so, but they are making a movie about my life. And uh, there's a couple of very famous actors that they're considering to play me. If I said their names, you would know who they are. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, But all that is still, uh, I, I'm not allowed to say because they want to make a big announcement when it happens with Variety Magazine and all the other Hollywood rags. Got it. We will know later. Got yeah, it. you will know later. Okay. <laughs> and and we're going to start. I, I this, When I've been here in, in Russia, yeah. my attorneys were negotiating with their, with the movie uh, producers' attorneys, and we just finished the night before last the last details of the contract. So probably while I'm here, I will sign the contract for the film while I'm here in Russia, mm -hmm. uh, because I'll have to do what's called doko, doko sign, you know, document sign, mm -hmm. uh, because I can't do it in person. Anyway, um, but we've got came to all the different agreements uh, for the film. Got it. Got it. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, please tell us about your experience in full us shooting. What uh, were the conditions? What maybe you liked and disliked? Full us was fun. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, there's two stories. Mm -hmm. The first time I went on full us, first uh, I'll, I'll go from the beginning. Mm -hmm. The first season, Johnny Thompson was one of their judges. Johnny Thompson and Michael Close, and Johnny Thompson is a very famous card man. He's headlining in Las Vegas since, since the 1950s, and he's been a friend of mine for a half a century. He died a year ago, um, uh, and he was 83. And um, so I kept getting this invitation to come on Penn and & Teller, and I ignored it. And then to the second season, I get, please, Richard, come on Penn & Teller. I ignored it. And then uh, finally I'm with Las, Johnny Thompson in Las Vegas. He says, Richard. Why are you ignoring my emails to come on Penn and Teller? I, I said, Johnny, I didn't know if it was you. If I would have known it was you, I would have said, okay. <clears throat> so the third season, I'm scheduled to go on. And the, they're filming Delt, the movie, they, the documentary they made about mm -hmm. me. And so they're going to fly in. They're flying in to get reactions from Penn and Teller uh, for the film, movie. But I went on Monday. We did our rehearsal. And... Um, and then I went to the gym, and I always go to the gym, and there was a machine in the gym when the benches that it like this, you can lay it like this and sit down and do it like this, or you can move it part like way, halfway up for like your tricep or make it up like this where you might, might do your curls or something. It was adjustable bench. And I tried to make it go down because I wanted to lay it flat. It wouldn't go down, and I couldn't figure out why. Then I realized somebody had put it up against the wall like this. And so I went like this, and that thing went wham! They came down and crushed my thumb. And, and did I stop? No. <laughs> I told my friend, I said, bring me a bucket of ice and don't ask any questions. Ice three minutes, exercise three minutes. Ice three minutes, exercise three minutes. Then I went to the producers, Penn and Teller producers. I said, um, I had an accident. I can't deal seconds because my thumb was is this big. It was that big. Mm -hmm. It just swelled up bigger than my toe. And I said, but I think I can do this. They said, what are you talking about? You're going to the emergency room. And so I ended up in surgery. And you can actually watch the surgery on um, Crush Dealing Thumb. Go to my web YouTube channel, mm -hmm. Crush Dealing Thumb. It's very gross because they take a spoon, they put it underneath there and pop my this finger up like a, like a, like a car ornament. 
and they cut it open, get the blood out. The bones in here were like this. Instead of like this, they were like this. Mm -hmm. Broke into all different pieces. So it took a whole year before my thumbnail grew back out. And so then uh, now I'm going on, on the fourth season. And uh, before John, uh, Michael Close and Johnny Thompson says, Richard, you have to tell us how you do this because we have to make a judgment. And I said, okay, watch. And he goes, oh my gosh, it really is impossible. <laughs> and so then I'm on, I'm, uh, I'm on stage. You all, everybody has seen this. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't have to explain what I did. But um, you see Teller on the thing just really going, and he tried to say, bring down the trophy. Two minutes into my show, it's a nine-minute show. Two minutes, to he's trying to tell them, bring down the trophy. And in the headpiece, they say, don't bring it down. We want Richard to do his whole act. Don't bring it down. And so then I'm supposed to have a six-minute interview with Allison, the, lady, the girl on the show. Mm -hmm. But they stood up, and then in the pen and tell her the earpiece, they hear Johnny Thompson say, don't ask us. We don't know how the hell he did it. <laughs> and so that's when Penn turns around and says, we have nothing to say. You fooled us. So I fooled them faster than anybody in the history of the show. They didn't even have a discussion. Yeah. And so now I'm talking with Penn uh, on, on stage. And you, some of that you probably see on the camera. Yeah. And then I go backstage with Penn. <clears throat> and backstage, I hear this voice go, Richard! Expletive, F, 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 F. I said, who's that? He goes, it's me, Teller. He said it was so wonderful to be so completely and thoroughly astonished. I've never seen anything like that in my life. That's exactly how he said it. He doesn't talk like that. He talks like you and me. Yeah. But he was so overwhelmed. And they said, can we take selfies together? And so he took a thousand selfies <clears throat> and then at midnight i'm in my hotel room <clears throat> ready to go sleep i get a call uh, they, it was their office they said teller wants to know if they can come get an autograph on a deck of cards from you i said this is backward i'm supposed to be asking for his autograph yeah. not me getting my autograph and then uh they say i says does pen want one too is oh would you do it pen would love it so that was kind of one of the stories, and then when I performed with them live later, like I said, I was doing all kinds of stuff for them, and they, uh, um, and and Teller was just right like this over and over, and I took, I took their cards, and they have very bad cards, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, and Penn says he even took our radio cards and did it with our cards, and Teller's still going, what the heck did he do? Yeah, that's a cool story. Uh, anyway, hope y'all had fun, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. It's so great. Richard yeah. Turner. Let me clean up my mess out of the way. Fantastic. Here's some more. Thank you. No problem. And uh, you and I just went oh, us. Yeah. We got nothing to say. He fooled us. Oh, my Get God. Get the right. Here. I so want to make this very it. clear to you, Richard. This trophy we're giving you, uh -huh. it says on it, <laughs> from the bottom of our hearts, Richard. From the bottom of our hearts. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. There thank you. Oh, go. my God. There you oh, go. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. about Americans Magic Convention, like which of them are the most famous and which uh, you like to visit? Well, the ones I did probably the most was the, de the Desert Magic Seminar, the one that Siegfried and Roy hosted from 1976 or 77 all the way up to the present. Um, that was the one I started going to, you know, 45, 45, 40 something years ago, uh, called the World, that was called the World Magic Seminar in Las Vegas. Um, and I was the last time I was there. I was the inner, the, one of the headliners. With uh, at that time, Leonard uh, Leonard Green was performing. We, we performed together. Um, uh, then uh, Magic Live is probably um, 
of one of the most prestigious mm -hmm. magic conventions. I was the, I was, I was, I, perform, I was the entertainment there three years ago, I think it was, with uh, Stan Allen, a very nice man. But Magic Live is probably the, one of the biggest ones there. Um, but I don't go to a lot of conventions because I'm, I'm busy performing. Um, magicians that don't have jobs, they go to magic conventions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Uh, at this moment, do you only perform in TV shows and giving workshops? Like, do you perform for magicians? I don't perform for magicians very often because I'm usually performing for corporations. I'm what's called a, I'm a, the entertainment for some of the biggest companies in the world like Apple, Google, uh, Facebook, all these are friends of mine. And uh, I'm the, what's they're called a speaker, keynote speaker, performer. So I do a uh, inspirational talk, inspiring their people to do the best possible at the same time blowing their minds. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do mostly. And it pays a lot more than just magic by itself. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. these big corporations have lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> and are you planning new lectures in near future? Maybe you can tell how you broke your finger before the first lecture. Uh, I'm not sure. You're talking about when I, on Penn and Teller, that one? Uh, when you say lecture, see, I. I think a lecture like a... This is how, it, uh, how it's written. Maybe it's the wrong information for me. Yeah, I don't understand the question. Okay. A lecture is like for magic? Yeah. Or you, uh, for magic lecture. I don't, I only do maybe, I, 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 I do one a year is all I have, my, I have, to have time for. I'll, uh, and then one time a year I will book the magic castle just to do it. Mm -hmm. But uh, otherwise I don't, um, I'm too busy to, to do Got it. magic lecture. Got it. And the only reason why here is because I'm doing TV special in Russia. And David, I said, uh, uh, let the, let the magi Magic Club know I'm coming to Russia. And we got a hold of first Dimitri, and then Dimitri to Kate, Kate. And they said, oh, please, please come. Can we do lecture? Can we do this? I said, and I, she said, how much? I said, surprise me. I do it for nothing. It was my pleasure. And he, but, um, but she surprised me, and, you know, and she charged. Mm -hmm. but, um, and then she said, will you do it for the, the school? Uh, they said they would like uh, uh, you to do it for the university. I said, they said, how much? I said, surprise me. I don't care. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so I, uh, um, I've done some things. And then Dimitri says, will you do workshop? Oh, workshop's so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said, OK, I'll do it, because you only hear once or at least right now, and, and I want, when I have a chance, to share with magicians to, and then hopefully encourage them, uh, you know, and I, and I have the time, I like, to, I, I like to do it, it's just usually I just don't have the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you're known for uh, very funny stories. Can you tell <laughs> us about some, some funny stories? Okay, yeah, because everybody knows that I see with my mind and my fingers. Yes. You know, my vision started going bad when I was a little boy. How old are you? Uh, nine. Nine. Nine, yes. nine years old. My sister, both of, I, both of us contracted a disease. She was five and I was nine mm -hmm. when, when it happened. And it, we, we think it came from scarlet fever. We both got scarlet fever and the same thing happened to both of us. But um, uh, so, like my wife, She's so immune to me running into things because it happens all the time. In fact, while we've been here, mm -hmm. well, it's almost gone now, and there's another little one <laughs> yeah, right here. It. That one happened. Um, this one was a wall, boom. It was a, fortunately, it was a, I was going very slow. This one, car door, bam, and this one is just about gone. So by the time when I film next week, it should be gone. Mm -hmm. So I run into things all the time. See, I block with my head to protect my hands. This is, this is valuable. This is not so valuable. <laughs> okay. Okay. And my wife, we're sitting in our chairs. She's in a recliner here reading a book. I'm sitting here with my cards shuffling. The telephone rings. I ran fast to answer the phone. I was slightly off just a little bit, and boom, right into the corner of the wall. And it made my head split open, and I'm pouring out blood. And my wife looked up and said, that one had to hurt. Yeah. And she said, when you get off the phone, don't forget to wipe up the blood. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I was on the driving range. You know, we hit golf balls, yeah. golf balls, with my uh, dentist. He's my golf buddy and my fishing buddy. And he went to the restroom. And we haven't played the course yet. We were just warming up on the, where you just hit ball after ball. And when I'd hit the ball, each time I put it down, I made a slight adjustment to the left. So instead of shooting this way, bam, I'm now shooting this way. And that's where the, the, the pro shop was, the, the building where they had all the golf equipment. The, and the golf pro is down there yelling over the big speakers, hey, you in the blue shirt, what the heck are you driving these balls over here for? And I wondered who the jerk was in the blue shirt because I couldn't tell what color shirt I had on. Yeah. And he said, are you crazy? And anyway, I just, bam, drove another two-inch bullet right towards his face. And then my doctor friend who I was golfing with heard over the speaker four times. He goes, something's wrong. And he comes out, he says, uh, Richard, did you hear the guy yelling about somebody hitting? I said, yeah, he's mad at him, hitting, throwing, shoot, hitting balls at his pro shop. He says, do you know what color shirt you're wearing? I said, it's not blue, is it? Yeah, it's blue. Uh-oh, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> um, uh, when, when my son, Ace of Spades, mm -hmm. in the movie Delt, a little side story. In the movie Delt, he's just going off to university, to college. Yeah. That's when he, we filmed that. That's in the movie. He's just going off to college. The movie comes out the year he graduates from college. So that shows you how long it takes to mm -hmm. make a movie. It took five years, and for four of those years, we had between two, six to 20 people, uh, no, six to 14 people, traveling with us around the world, living in our homes, just getting 3,000 hours of footage that they used to make that 90-minute movie. But, um, but um, anyway, my son, when he was about seven, uh, we were at a restaurant, and he had to use the restroom. So we, two urinals, you know, he gets next to this one and then I'm waiting, then it's my turn, I'm getting next to this one and I'm looking over at him and I'm going, singing a song going, I love to pee and get the pee out of me when I feel this little tap on my back and the little voice from behind go, um, dad, I finished, that's another man you're singing to and my wife had to bring up the point because he was little so I was looking, mm -hmm. looking down at him like this, you know, towards him. And that means I was looking right at that man's mm -hmm. private parts, <laughs> embarrassed. <laughs> um, uh, oh, one time I, I got up and I put toothpaste on my brush. And I started brushing. Ah, it was awful. I said, I asked my wife, what kind of toothpaste is this? It's, it tastes wretched. She laughed. She said, that's not toothpaste. That's spermicide. It's for birth control. If you keep using that, we'll never have kids. So women use it to make them yeah, so they yeah. don't get pregnant. Yes. And I thought it was toothpaste. <laughs> <laughs> but probably the funniest one is I came up with a really bright idea. I came up with a perfect idea for the blind and deaf driver. I bought a motorcycle. I was actually in a poker game. And I won some money. And I bought a motorcycle. And... I had a friend, his name was Roy Ottoman. He was deaf. So he'd sit behind me and go, red light, red light, green light, green light, left, 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 right, right, right. Because the big Ottoman came behind me had this high squeaky voice come out of his body because he couldn't hear mm -hmm. himself. And so one day there was a Winchell's Donut Shop, a place where you buy donuts. Mm -hmm. Somebody just robbed the place. And we fit the profile of the robbers to a T. And we were pulled over and... It was only after we proved to the cop that I couldn't see the lights flashing, he couldn't hear the siren blasting, when I received a ticket for driving while blind, and then the cop says, now drive away. <laughs> he <laughs> so lets you go. He let us drive away. And then the, uh, the, another part of that story is, I, I, now I'm scared, I go, oh my gosh, I, you know, I, can't, I can no longer drive my motorcycle. Uh -huh. And I had to go to court, and I didn't know what the judge was gonna say. When they find out you're driving a, car, a motorcycle, a blind man driving a motorcycle, are you crazy? And so I'm waiting, and they and I get up there, and they, they change judges, and was, his name was Judge Lord. And they said, you better hope you get Judge Lord because he's a little nicer. Mm -hmm. And they just changed his judge when it was my case. And I said, um, Judge, I'm sorry, but 
I can't see well enough to get a license. I'm, I'm blind. And he goes, what? You can't see well enough to get a license? Well, then case dismissed. I went, huh? <laughs> oh, 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 good. I thought he was going to say, are you crazy? Yeah. Instead, he said, case dismissed. Cool. Um, uh, did you hear, oh, that's a tricky question. Did you hear about Russian magicians? Can you name maybe somebody from Russian magicians? Uh, no, I can't, but mm -hmm. I, only because I don't, remember, I don't remember people by their name, and your names are too hard anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I remember by uh, meeting, I've met Russian magicians. Uh, um, when I hit FISM uh, last year, I was the entertainment. And a very nice Russian magician gave me th one of these close-up pads he made for me, my color, the blue, mm -hmm. and I still have it at my house, and I use it every night. I put it on my lap, and I think uh, this came from my friend from Russia. Mm -hmm. And um, um, but so I've met Russian magicians, but... I, I, have, I can't even remember my own name, <laughs> let alone some of your names. Okay, I got yeah. it. And here we are uh, at the last question. Oh my gosh, that was fast. <laughs> uh, can you give free advices from Richard Turner to other magicians? Like top three. Yeah. Top three advices. Well, yeah. Free, not three. Yeah. Three. Yes. Not free. Okay. Oh. <laughs> free. Similar, yeah. yeah. Um, one is... Be unique. Mm -hmm. Be different. Don't be another copy of somebody else. If you're a copy of somebody else, uh, you, you, you won't have the same potential. You have to think about how and what can I do to make what I do different. That, to what, what I do, that it will stand out. And the second is, if you make it something that is difficult, then they won't copy you. Because it's one thing, maybe you now come out with a very clever ideas and they go and then this but just go oh I like that and then they they steal your ideas so you don't want to steal their ideas and you don't want them to steal your ideas mm -hmm. so come up with things where it's creative it's different and then it also takes work it takes an effort to to learn how to do it because then then you don't become uh, someone doesn't then take your act and try to steal it and also, I like to tell just everybody, whatever you do, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Or that say, they say, that's impossible. Don't believe people to when they say that's impossible. Have a healthy disregard for people when they tell you that. I say take possible out of impossible. When I, the things I do with the cards, Professor Vernon says was not possible. Yeah. But I took possible out of impossible. And then also, I, one more thing, three, is we all have challenges. We all have something that we have to deal with. In my case, I can't see, mm -hmm. okay? And, and for a lot of people, that's a scary thing. And they would think, you, there's no way you can do something. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can be uh, known around the world um, or, or get to that level. That They would think, that's, that, that, that's not possible. Don't let people tell you something's impossible. And like I said, we all have some kind of challenge. And what we do is we take that challenge and turn it into an adventure. Mm -hmm. I always take, I always think of every challenge. I've had the challenge with my thumb on Penn and Teller where it was smashed. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't start crying. I, I laughed. I thought a new adventure, a new challenge. How am I going to be back on stage with a crushed thumb, where the bones were crushed, the nerves were killed? And uh, so I looked at it as an adventure. It's like, who wants to read a book? I've read, a, I've read a, I, I, can't just, just, I can't even pronounce their names, but I've read a number of books written by famous Russian authors, mm -hmm. classics. And uh, who wants to read a book where, oh, he runs the race, he wins. He, he climbs the mountain, he climbs to the top. He, he gets married, he's in love forever. You don't want, you want, yeah, you have to have, the ups and downs. You have to have the challenges because life without challenges like reading a book where there's no, where there's no conflict. Yeah. You follow, follow what I mean? Yes, you, I got it. So you have to look at every situation that you come in your life. Um, if it's poverty or if it's um, the fact that you, maybe your, your parents were not very nice, mm -hmm. you had a hard upbringing, or maybe you have no money, or maybe you have too much money, you know, um, 
you look at those as adventures mm -hmm. and look at it as part of the, the book that you're reading. You want a book that's exciting, that has ups and downs. And when you have the downs, that makes those ups even more exciting. If it's like this all the time, boring. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So that was a good question for the ending. <laughs> yeah. Richard, thank you very much for being with uh, us. Thank you very much for visiting Russia. Thank you. Let's clap for Richard. <laughs> Thank you so much. To all my Russian friends, all my Russian magician friends, thank you. It was such a pleasure to meet you. I can't wait to see you again. Hope you enjoy the show. Take care. Until next time, Richard signing off.